Ladies and gentlemen, this evening's lecture is very much a continuation of last week's lecture. Last week, I discussed in brief outline the nature of self-esteem, why self-esteem is a fundamental psychological need of man, what conditions are necessary for the attainment of self-esteem, and how self-esteem is commonly betrayed. In discussing man's need of self-esteem, I drew your attention to the fact that the root of that need lies in the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness. Now then, the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness and the fact that his life depends upon the exercise of his mind, upon his reason, imposes upon man a solemn responsibility. The fact, to repeat, that man is a rational being, a being whose basic means of survival is his mind, and the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness, imposes upon man a solemn responsibility, one which many men revolt against and seek to escape. What is the nature of this responsibility? Since man's rational faculty does not function automatically, man must, first of all, choose to initiate a reasoning process. He must choose to check and test his conclusions by constant observation and by a rigorous process of logic and he must choose to be guided by his rational judgment. Since his consciousness is not infallible, he can make an error at any step of the way. If he leaves the error uncorrected and acts on it, he will be acting against the facts of reality, and suffering and self-destruction will be the result. Alone, facing the universe, relying exclusively upon his own mind, man has to be crucially concerned that he use his mind properly, that he exercise his rational powers to the utmost, that he know what he is doing when he acts, that he knows what he is doing and why when he chooses the values he chooses, because should he choose wrong and act wrong, to repeat, suffering and self-destruction will be the result. Now. There are two ways, in essence, that a man can respond to these facts and to the responsibility they entail. A man can accept and welcome them, or he can resent and dread them. The first response leads to the achievement of self-esteem. The second, to neurosis, to anxiety, to inferiority complex. A psychologically healthy man is one who accepts the responsibility entailed in being a volitional being, who accepts the responsibility of thought, who accepts the responsibility of choice, who accepts and welcomes the responsibility of passing judgments. And that includes passing judgment on the issue of values, on the values and goals by which he is to live that are going to guide his actions and his life. Now, it's possible for man, and indeed many men do, to revolt against the responsibility inherent in their own nature, to seek escape from the responsibility of volition, to evade the effort of thought, to prefer a state of mental fog, and to drift at the mercy of blind feelings. It's possible, in a word, to a greater or lesser extent, to rebel against the necessity of judging reality and of judging it independently with one's own mind. To the extent to which one rebels against this responsibility, one defaults on the process of proper human growth, one sabotages one's own intellectual development, one doesn't grow intellectually as one should, and to this extent one sabotages the efficacy of one's mind. 
and the consequence of this is to sentence oneself to the mounting terror of feeling that one is inadequate to and unfit for existence. To the extent to which a person rebels against the responsibility of thinking and to the extent to which he seeks to solve the problem by relying on the consciousness of others instead, to that extent he sabotages his own intellectual and psychological growth, he sabotages his intellectual development, and he declares himself, in effect, a second-rate citizen metaphysically. That is, he accepts the fact, early in life, that he is not to come into first-hand contact with reality, so to speak, that he is not going to think and judge and choose on his own. This is too much trouble. The risks are too great if he fails. And so instead he will look to others to provide for him the guidance which his own thinking should have provided instead. This state, of course, is not reached in a day, a week, or a month. It is the cumulative result of a long succession of defaults, evasions, and irrationalities. A long succession of failures to use one's mind properly. Confronted with the choice to initiate the mental effort needed to pursue knowledge, to focus his mind, to think, or not to bother, the irrationalist characteristically chooses not to bother, particularly if crucial issues are at stake. Why, particularly, if crucial issues are at stake? Because the risk is that much more terrifying. Because he does not want his life or happiness to depend upon anything so fragile, as he sees it, as his own mind. Confronted with the choice to stand by the judgment of his mind or to act on feelings, wishes or fears, which he knows to be irrational, he characteristically sticks by his feelings and defies his mind in validating its judgment. For example, he indulges wishes which he knows to be irrational. He gives in to fears which he knows to be irrational. And doing so again and again, he builds up in his mind this kind of precedent. In any clash within me between my mind or my rational judgment and a strong feeling, it's my mind that goes. That, in effect, is the operating premise which after a while becomes implicit. And this, of course, in turn undermines enormously any self-esteem that he might possess because he knows that there is a fundamental corruption built into the mechanism, built into the fundamental psychoepistemological policy of the mechanism. Confronted with the choice between his own understanding and the assertions of others, he characteristically abandons his own understanding, finding it safer to pass the responsibility of judgment to others. This is one of the most widespread forms in which men can attempt to revolt against the requirements of their own nature. However, there is no escape from reality, there is no escape from man's nature and from the manner of survival that his nature requires. Every living species that possesses awareness can survive only by the guidance of its consciousness. That is the role and the function of consciousness in a living organism. Man can survive only by the guidance of his kind of consciousness, a consciousness that has to function volitionally, that has to focus, perceive, draw abstractions, gain knowledge, pass judgments, form values, decide what are the right goals to pursue in order to survive and to procure his well-being. If a man rejects this responsibility, if he decides that thinking is too much effort, that the perception of reality is not his concern, why then if he wants to survive, he can survive only by means of the perceptions and the judgments of others. If he does not choose to judge reality himself, the only choice open to him is to follow blindly the judgments of others. He does not know what to do, but he does know that knowledge is required to make decisions in face of the countless alternatives that confront him every day of his life. 
He knows that he has nothing to guide him inside his mind but the chaotic jumble of random notions, snatches of unformulated impressions, bits of unintegrated ideas, pieces of unpursued thoughts, whirling and swimming in the fog of his one constant emotion, namely anxiety. He knows that he does not know how to live, but others seem to know it. Others have survived and are surviving around him. So the only way to survive, he feels, is to follow their lead and to live by their knowledge. They know, and they will spare him the risk and the effort. They know, somehow, they possess control of that mysterious, unknowable reality. He does not have to know or to perceive the world as it is and assume the responsibility of judgment, so he feels. Instead, he can look at people, watch what they do, guess what they see, get attuned to their manner of thinking, and develop a skill for a special sight, the world as perceived by others. Thus, he is led to shape his soul in the image of a parasite inconceivable in any other living species. Not a parasite of body, but a parasite of consciousness. Now, what I wish to emphasize is the following. What this type of person seeks is not material support. Oh, some men of this type are financial moochers, but they are comparatively a minority. And the state of being a material parasite is only the consequence of a deeper mental cause anyway. No, this type seeks a consciousness other than his own to replace the mind he has chosen to discard. He is begging humanity at large to take care of him on a level far deeper than financial to tell him how to live. This means to set his goals, to choose his values, to prescribe his actions, never to leave him alone at the mercy of his own unreliable mind. He may be willing to work, to obey, and even to think within a limited square if others will assume responsibility for his ultimate direction. Now, to understand his psychology, let us contrast it very briefly with that of a man of authentic, healthy self-esteem. A man of self-esteem and sovereign consciousness deals with reality, with nature, with an objective universe of facts. He holds his mind as his tool of survival, and he develops his ability to think. But the man who has abandoned his mind lives not in a universe of facts, but in a universe of people. People, not facts, are his reality. People, not reason, are his tool of survival. It is with them that he has to deal. It is on them that his consciousness must focus. It is them who he must understand or please or placate, or deceive, or maneuver, or manipulate, or obey. It is his success at this task that becomes the gauge of his fitness to exist, of his competence to live. Having alienated himself from objective reality, he has no other standard of truth, no other standard of rightness or personal worth. To grasp and successfully to satisfy the expectations, the conditions, demands, terms, values of others is experienced by him as his deepest, most urgent need. The approval of others is his only form of assurance that he is right, that he is doing well. The temporary diminution of his anxiety that their approval offers him is his substitute for self-esteem. Thus, taking you again to the concept of last week's lecture, we can say in a very broad way that this man, early in life, ties his pseudo-self-esteem to his ability not to deal with the objective facts of reality, but to satisfy the 
terms, expectations, values, frame of reference of others. Now, men can hold this attitude, this policy, to varying degrees. It can dominate their personality or psychology, or it can be present only to a comparatively small extent. Yes, this form of neurosis can exist in men in various degrees of intensity and various degrees of destructiveness. It exists in the majority of people to some extent. The name which I have given to this particular phenomenon is social metaphysics. Why social metaphysics? I mean this designation to be taken literally. Well, remember, a metaphysics is a view of the nature of reality. One's metaphysics is one's view of the nature of reality. To the man I have been describing, reality is people. In his mind, in his thinking, in the automatic connections of his mind, people occupy the place which, in the mind of a rational man, is occupied by reality. Just as a rational man bases his self-esteem on his ability to deal with objective reality, so this man bases his self-value on his ability to deal with people. What do I mean when I say that in this man's mind, people occupy the place which in the mind of a rational person is occupied by reality? Well, to understand what that means, consider the following. Try to project exactly what we mean when we talk about reality being present in our mind. Ordinarily, we don't think of reality as such in our daily actions. We take it for granted. The concept has become built into our minds as an automatic frame of reference and standard of judgment. So that if, for example, to give a simple example, I ask you, what color is the ceiling of this room? You would automatically almost look up to see it. You would look to the facts of reality. And in such a case, you couldn't imagine what else one could possibly look to or refer to. But if I asked you a more abstract question, such as, for what purpose should man live? Many people would find that the first thought to leap into their mind would not be the question, what in reason is the purpose for which man should live, but rather, what do people think it is? What have I heard said it is? This is social metaphysics. Now, if I asked you what did you do this morning and suggested that you take a public poll in order to find out what you did do, you would consider my suggestion absurd. Yet there is no difference in principle between that question and the question for what moral purpose should man live. Both questions refer to reality, and there is nothing else to refer to. There is, of course, an important difference between these two questions. The second is more abstract than the first. It is in the realm of abstractions that a social metaphysician suspends his judgment. He is willing and able to perceive the immediately given, the concrete and the simplest familiar abstractions, and for the most part to trust his judgment on that level but it is on the level of higher abstractions, and most particularly on the level of value judgments, that his mind goes blank. And instead of reality, all he thinks of is the consciousness of others, their beliefs, their views, their sense of things, in order to learn the truth. Social metaphysics, then, may be defined and summarized as follows. Social metaphysics is the psychological syndrome a syndrome means, of course, a collection of symptoms characterizing a specific illness. Social metaphysics is the psychological syndrome that characterizes an individual who holds the consciousnesses of other men, not objective reality, as his ultimate psychoepistemological frame of reference. To repeat, Social metaphysics is the psychological syndrome that characterizes an individual who holds the consciousnesses of other men, not objective reality, as his ultimate psychoepistemological frame of reference. 
Perhaps the worst form of self-degradation and the worst punishment that social metaphysicians endure is their contempt for their own judgment. A man of sovereign consciousness places nothing higher than reality and no judgment of reality higher than his own. He does not accept an idea as true or valid unless he recognizes it to be so by his own rational understanding. If a social metaphysician judges an idea to be true, the fact that he used his own judgment tends to invalidate the idea. Any conviction he forms lacks conviction for him because it is his own. Any idea advanced by others tends to be extra convincing because it is not his. He feels implicitly that others have a wisdom superior to his own, granted to them by the fact that they are non-himself. He may not always give in to them, but his emotions will always pull him secretly to acknowledge their superiority. His own mind to him is not an instrument of certainty, but of self-doubt and mistrust. He feels, who am I to know? Who am I to judge? How can I tell? His attitude amounts to, how can I live my life by the guidance of nothing but so precarious, so puny, so feeble, so uncertain, so unreliable a thing as my mind? If one discusses the importance of reason with a social metaphysician, he frequently will ask, whose reason? And will proceed to complain that experts disagree in every field, so how can one tell what is reasonable? It will never occur to a man of independent judgment, to a man of sovereign consciousness, to ask such a question as, whose reason? And it never occurs to a social metaphysician that the answer is one's own. Social metaphysicians attach an abnormal emotional significance to the opinions of others much beyond any practical consideration, beyond any reason they can name, without reason, as a primary. The dislike or disagreement of others has the immediate effect of shaking their judgment, whether they actually give in to others or not. Many a social metaphysician has described to me the following phenomenon. He goes to a party, in the course of a conversation at a party, he expresses some ideas which meet with violent opposition, and in the course of his argument, he feels himself coming apart at the seam psychopistemologically. He forgets all the facts, arguments, and proofs which he knew to support his own position an hour earlier. He's literally paralyzed in the vice of fear, and he feels he cannot think. He cannot remember facts which he knew perfectly well. Why? What can cause this kind of psychological, this kind of psychopistemological paralysis? Something which matters far more to him because it is an issue of values, something that matters far more to him than the truth or falsehood of the issues involved. Others disagree. Others are frowning or looking angry or indignant or contemptuous or are ridiculing or are expressing opposition in one form or another. That fact liquefies him psychologically. I remember a particular young man who suffered from a rather severe case of social metaphysics, attending college, and he would get into arguments sometimes with his professor or professors, and he would put forth some view, then the professor or the class would express some opposition. He wouldn't, the young man wouldn't lose the conviction that his position was true. He wouldn't even in this particular case lose the memory of the reasons to support his conviction only he would find the following emotional shift occurring. He would have a sense that the ideas involved exist at some infinite distance from him, that they're of no importance one way or the other, that his knowledge that his position is true or right is of no importance, no emotional significance one way or the other. It all feels far away, infinitely far away, and what's up close is only the fear of his classmates and the professor's opposition or disapproval. Truth doesn't matter to him any longer, nor facts, nor reality, nor his own convictions. 
What matters is only the fact that others don't think it's true. Afterwards, he walks out of the classroom feeling a wave of self-contempt, feeling like a traitor with justice. In order to understand the peculiar nature of social metaphysics, I have to emphasize once again that the kind of dependence which I am discussing is not primarily a material dependence. It's not an issue of financial support. That can sometimes be involved for individual people, but that's not what the fundamental problem is. The fundamental problem is a person who has either never acquired or relinquished the concept of an objective reality apart from the beliefs, the views, the ideas, the notions of other people. He doesn't have in his mind a clear concept of reality as apart from the consensus of his particular significant others, as it were. I wrote an article in the Objectivist Newsletter some time ago dealing with one aspect of the psychology of social metaphysics in which I told an anecdote, an experience which happened to me around seven or eight years ago which I'd like to repeat for you here because it's very relevant by way of illuminating the nature of the social metaphysician's alienation from reality. The incident really is something of a horror story in a very quiet way. Briefly, it's this. A young man came to see me at the suggestion of a mutual acquaintance who thought that objectivism might help the young man with his personal and professional problems. After I had answered a number of questions concerning the objectivist philosophy, the young man looked at me nervously, and then he said, and this is a verbatim quote, it's not the sort of thing one forgets, but if I accept these ideas, my friends will kill me. They won't let me live. No one will let you live. Do you mean, I asked, that you expect your friends to murder you? No, of course not, he answered. Do you expect them to lock you in a room and starve you to death? No. Well, then what do you mean? I mean, they won't let me live. I was unable to obtain any other answer from him or any explanation. He kept repeating, they won't let me live as if it were a self-evident fact, an axiom understood by everybody and taken for granted. Our mutual acquaintance who had brought him was dumbfounded and kept asking, what on earth do you mean? The young man seemed unable to explain. He left and I never heard from him again. I knew what he meant, but one seldom hears it stated quite that openly. The incident involving this young man focuses with unusual clarity the peculiar nature of the social metaphysician's dependence and fear. The, the dependence is deeper than any practical or tangible consideration. The material forms of parasitism and exploitation that some men practice are merely one of its consequences. The basic dependence is psychoepistemological, a parasitism of cognition, of judgment, of values, a wish to function within a context established by others to live by the guidance of rules for which one does not bear ultimate intellectual responsibility. To repeat, a parasitism of consciousness. Since the social metaphysician's pseudo-self-esteem rests on his ability to deal with the world as perceived by others, his fear of disapproval or condemnation is the fear of being pronounced inadequate to reality, unfit for existence, devoid of personal worth, a verdict which he hears whenever he is rejected. The meaning of the boy's statement, they won't let me live, is they won't keep me alive, they won't take care of me, they'll withdraw their approval. I'll be abandoned in an unknowable reality. The non-venal, non-practical nature of the social metaphysician's dependence is illustrated in the following example. Now, this example was based upon a person who I know myself, but it's a phenomenon which is so common that uh, there are many, many duplicates in small variations of this psychology 
and I rather suspect that many of you will know from your own experience the kind of type of person I'm talking about. I'm thinking of a social metaphysician who is a multimillionaire and who is obsessively concerned with the issue of what everyone thinks of him, even his office boy. He feels driven to win the office boy's approval or liking. He watches eagerly for any signs of a personal response, and any indication of the boy's indifference or dislike makes him feel depressed or anxious. He finds himself being compulsively charming in order to win the boy's admiration. Now, this man certainly has nothing practical to gain from the boy's favor, neither money, nor advice, nor prestige, nor business advantage. In any practical business sense, the boy is his inferior. Yet the multimillionaire feels that he must win the boy's affection. What significance, then, does the boy have for him? It is not the office boy as an actual person that he seeks to placate or charm, but rather the office boy as a symbol of other people, of any other people, of mankind at large. The implicit thought behind his compulsion is not this office boy is a potential provider who will take care of me and guide me, but rather I am acceptable to other people, people who are non-me approve of me. They regard me as a good human being. It is this kind of subservience, this kind of dependence, which is responsible for the profound sense of humiliation which most social metaphysicians endure to a greater or lesser extent. A kind of sense of living under blackmail of constantly having to placate or appease that nameless others. And here, this sense of humiliation, this fear, this crawling kind of dependence gives rise to a very significant social phenomenon. It leads to very, very evil consequences socially, to many, but I want to focus on one, and that is that it is this kind of fear which lies at the root of the process by which men can surrender the world to evil. Not a practical fear, that must be emphasized. Not a practical fear, not the response to a tangible threat. Something absolutely non-practical on the deepest level. One of the commonest devices by which the social metaphysician conceals from himself the nature of his own fear and cowardice is to tell himself when he surrenders or capitulates to views or people who he doesn't respect that he's being practical, that he's acting out of practical considerations. I wrote an article dealing with this phenomenon, as I say some time ago in the newsletter, called Social Metaphysical Fear. And to illustrate how this process worked, I gave a few case examples which were based upon individual cases known by me which are very suggestive because many other closely related types exist which you will all recognize. I want to quote a bit from myself because these cases are really archetypical. I want you to observe the following in these cases. What these cases illustrate is the manner in which men prompted by a degrading fear they dare not acknowledge and so cannot overcome, invent non-existent dangers or grossly exaggerate minor ones, betray their own minds, sell out whatever authentic rationality they possess, and contribute to the spread of values inimical to their own, and acquire a vested interest in believing that men are unavoidably evil, that human existence is evil, that the good has no chance on earth. The first case is that of a professor of philosophy who is an atheist. He knows that the arguments for the existence of God are thoroughly indefensible. He regards the notion of a supernatural being as irrational and destructive. He despises mysticism and considers himself an advocate of reason. But he evades the issue of atheism versus theism in his books and lectures refuses to commit himself on the subject publicly, and every Sunday attends church with his parents and relatives. 
He does not tell himself that his motive is fear, that he is terrified to stand alone against his family, friends, and colleagues, that violent arguments of any kind make him panicky, and that he desperately wants to feel accepted. No, this is not what he tells himself. Instead, he tells himself that if he were to acknowledge his atheism, his career would be ruined, evading the fact that many professors are known atheists and their careers are unaffected by it. He tells himself that he is reluctant to cause pain to his elderly parents who are devoutly religious and who would be dismayed by his lack of faith, evading the fact that he is not obliged to convert his parents, merely to state his own convictions, and that a man who takes ideas seriously does not sacrifice his own judgments, which he knows to be rational, in order to placate people whose beliefs he knows to be irrational. His rationalizations serve to shield him from a full recognition of his treason. But because it cannot be blanked out entirely, he is condemned to struggle against secret feelings of self-contempt, and he retaliates by cursing the malevolence of the system and of reality, since he cannot have his treason and his self-esteem too. Consider the case of a successful playwright who selects some important theme as the subject of a play a theme requiring and deserving a serious dramatic presentation, who then realizes that his viewpoint will antagonize a great many people. He decides, therefore, to write the play as a comedy, making good-natured fun of the things he regards as evil, counting on his humor to prevent anyone from taking his view seriously and being offended or antagonized. He does not tell himself that he dreads to be regarded as unfashionable. Instead, he tells himself that serious plays dealing with controversial ideas are non-commercial and dismisses the many exceptions as freaks requiring no explanation. But he cannot entirely elude the knowledge that he has sold out the motive that prompted his desire to write the play in the first place. So he retaliates against his discomforting sense of moral uncleanliness by cursing the stupidity and the bad taste of the masses. Consider the case of a scientist who despises the obscurantist jargon that is rampant in his profession and the postulates underlying that jargon, who is rationally convinced that the theories of many of his most highly regarded colleagues are wrong. But he twists his brain to adopt that jargon in his own writings, dilutes his criticisms in every possible way, and strives to smuggle his own ideas into the minds of his readers in such a manner that no one will notice the extent of his departure from established belief. He does not tell himself that he is afraid of being ridiculed as an outsider or that he abjectly hungers for the esteem of men he regards as pretentious incompetence. Instead, he tells himself that he is playing it smart, that when he becomes famous, he will be the term setter, and that the practical way to become famous to become a successful innovator is to make himself indistinguishable from everyone else. But he cannot entirely drown the knowledge that this was not the view of science with which he started, and that the youth who had been himself would find it strange to be told that devotion to truth is served by catering to falsehood. So he retaliates by cursing the malevolence of a universe in which the concept of a fashionable innovator is a contradiction in terms. Consider finally the all too common case of the businessman who recognizes that capitalism is the only rational and just social system. He knows the intelligence, independence, and dedication which industrial production requires. He knows that he earns his profits. He loves his work and is secretly proud of it. But he apologizes for his success publicly contributes financially to intellectual organizations explicitly devoted to his destruction, accepts the government's expropriation of his wealth and infringement of his rights without moral protest, and begs mankind at large to forgive him for the sin of possessing ability. He does not tell himself that he is afraid to challenge the prevailing value system which damns his way of life as ignoble, selfish, and materialistic even though that value system has never made sense to him. He does not tell himself that he cannot bear to feel alienated from all those who support that value system. He does not tell himself 
that the responsibility of passing independent judgments in the realm of morality fills him with dread. Instead, he tells himself that his policy is motivated solely by the desire to protect his business interests, that it is good sense not to antagonize government officials, that it is shrewd public relations to finance intellectuals of the statist persuasion so that they will see that he is a nice guy, that it is bad business to court unpopularity. His secret fear takes the form of imagining that the masses are unthinking brutes, that they are the ultimate masters of reality, they can kill him and take over his property whenever they wish, so they must be placated, they must be told that he works only to serve them, he must restrain them by assuring them that theirs is the right superseding all other rights. This, he tells himself, is hard-headed realism. But he cannot entirely escape the disquieting awareness somewhere within him that his appeasement is not prompted by the motives he names, that his practicality and cynicism are protective affectations, masking something worse. So he retaliates by cursing human irrationality and the malevolence of a world which demands that he be concerned with moral issues one way or the other. Such is the manner in which men deliver the world to evil. In all such cases and countless others, hiding behind the pretense that their fear is of some practical, tangible threat, what is being concealed is the fact that what is really at stake is the issue of standing intellectually alone of being sovereign in the sphere of value judgments, of pronouncing moral judgments on the fundamental issues of human existence and of building one's life on those judgments. That is what the social metaphysician is terrified of and that is the responsibility from which his whole life represents an attempted escape. Now to continue our discussion of the psychology of social metaphysics. From my foregoing, unfortunately too brief analysis of social metaphysics, the picture which will almost inevitably appear in your mind to stand for the social metaphysician will be someone, let us say, like Peter Keating in the Fountainhead. The organization man, the conformist, to use modern language. However, as I want to show you in the next little while, this is only the most easily recognizable type of social metaphysician. There are many other types which are quite different and sometimes harder to diagnose. But first, let's briefly discuss the simplest, most obvious kind of social metaphysician, the kind, as I say, symbolized by a character like Peter Keating in The Fountainhead. I use him because obviously it's a character whom you all know. Now, Keating is quite explicitly on the premise of who am I to think? Who am I to make value judgments? Keating is not especially interested with what is or is not true, nor with what is good or bad. What then is important to him? What people believe to be truth and reality? What people believe to be good and bad? All of Keating's actions rest on and are explicable only in terms of the premise that his survival depends not on his ability to grasp the actual facts of reality and to act accordingly, but rather his survival depends on his ability to grasp and adjust to other people's views of reality, other people's beliefs about reality. I am as you desire me, such is Keating's premise. Always be what people want you to be, he tells Rourke. Then you've got them where you want them. Now, Keating differs from other social metaphysicians of his type only in that he is more self-conscious about his motives than most of them are. But he deludes himself in the belief that he fakes his person for others merely in order to gain practical advantages. 
for in fact there is no real person beneath the fake. There is only a shapeless fear. Peter Keating is utterly selfless, and one of the most brilliant points in the Fountainhead is the illustration that Keating is what selflessness, that allegedly noble ideal, actually means. If it's good to have no ego, Keating has none. If it's good to be selfless, Keating is as selfless as any mystical saint. He hasn't a desire or a value or a goal to call his own, truly. Keating's standard of self-appraisal is the view others hold of him. His pseudo-self-esteem is based on such smiles of approval, such applause, such recognition as he does receive. And to the extent that he doesn't receive it, he feels tense, nervous, anxious. Observe that if others think Keating great, this does not literally make him feel that he is great. No pseudo-self-esteem can accomplish that, but it does make him feel relatively more secure. A security expressed in the feeling, I'm getting away with it. But his very success leads him to still more intense potential anxiety. The dread of being found out. The dread of having his inner emptiness, his essential fraudulence, revealed. And this is why the Cosmoslotnik competition precipitates an anxiety attack in him. Remember the context at this point in the story. Keating is on his way up as an apparently brilliant young architect. He enters the foremost architectural competition in the country and proceeds to feel stark terror that he will lose. Let me quote a brief passage from the Fountainhead. Quote, This was fear. This was what one feels in a nightmare, thought Peter Keating. Only then one awakens when it becomes unbearable. But he could neither awaken nor bear it any longer. It had been growing for days, for weeks, and now it had caught him, this lewd, unspeakable dread of defeat. He would lose the competition, he was certain that he would lose it, and the certainty grew as each day of waiting passed. He could not work. He jerked when people spoke to him. He had not slept for nights. He tried not to notice the faces of the people he passed, but he had to notice. He had always looked at people, and people looked at him as they always did. He wanted to shout at them and tell them to turn away, to leave him alone. They were staring at him, he thought, because he was to fail, and they knew it. Close quote. Why is Keating so frightened? He tells himself that his fear is only for the practical consequences. But his career does not actually hang in the balance of this competition. It would not really be a disgrace if he didn't win, not the kind of disgrace Keating is projecting. Keating's terror, in fact, is metaphysical, not immediate and practical. His whole life has lived over an abyss, the abyss of being found out. Any failure, he feels, can give him away. Any rejection will unmask his essential emptiness. What is it that really terrifies him? Other people's condemnation? No, his agreement with them. Keating does have his better moments, his moments of sovereign perception and judgment, such as are evidenced in his appreciation of Rourke. But these moments are his exceptions. He invariably betrays them in action because they clash with the social value system which he dares not challenge and to which he is enslaved. It is not that sovereign moments are impossible to him or to his type, but that social metaphysics forbids him to remain loyal to such moments and to make them the rule of his existence. Now, not all members of his type are necessarily as socially aggressive as Peter Keating. They may not, as he does, aspire to rise to the tops of their professions. They may just want to be an officer at their golf club or lead the ladies' knitting circle or be accepted into the ladies' knitting circle or be the first fellow in the gang to knife a schoolmate. <laughs> What is the essential of this type? It is the desperate need to conform to the values of a specific culture or subculture and to be accepted by the representatives of that culture or subculture. That is the foundation of their neurotic self-appraisal. Today, as you know, it has become very fashionable to denounce this type of conformity. Today, indeed, only a non-conformist would dare not to denounce conformity. 
The psychological profession has been very ardent in these denunciations. The meaning of most of it, however, is only that one group of Peter Keatings is sore at another group of Peter Keatings for conforming to something other than what the first group would like them to conform to. Now, I said that this type of obvious conformist is only the most obvious type of social metaphysician. What other routes can social metaphysics take? In order to understand, I have to remind you of a very important issue covered in last week's lecture. You will remember my discussion of this, that when a person betrays the rational requirements of self-esteem, he forms a pseudo-self-esteem or struggles to form it. That is, some irrational alternative standard a standard other than rationality, that is, which, by living up to it, he imagines that he will be able to enjoy a sense of positive self-value. So, let us say, he bases his pseudo-self-esteem upon being stoical, or, quote, doing the right thing, or doing one's duty, or what have you. Now, let's consider the psychology of the social metaphysician. The social metaphysician, early in life, abandons the responsibility of independent judgment, and, initially, he ties his self-esteem, his pseudo-self-esteem, directly to the approval of others and his ability to live up to their expectations, etc., and so forth. However, even this neurotic standard still involves a struggle at which it's possible to fail. After all, not everybody is a successful conformist. Many people are not. And all people who struggle feel that they are not. They always feel somebody else is really in. The social metaphysician knows a special kind of agonizing loneliness, which he is alone to know, no matter how popular he may be. Now then, suppose that the social metaphysician defaults on the responsibility of rationality, forms a pseudo-self-esteem tied to the approval of others, but comes to feel inadequate to the task of acquiring that approval. In other words, what if he feels that he cannot live up to the standards or the expectations or the values of others? What if this new neurotic standard also is frightening to him, or he feels very insecure in his ability successfully to gain the approval of others? Why then he has to form, or is driven to form, a secondary pseudo-self-esteem to protect him against his failure with regard to the first level of pseudo-self-esteem. In other words, first he has a feeling of inferiority or inadequacy because he's inadequate to reality. He tries to deal with that by gaining the approval of others, and he makes that the standard by which he'll judge himself. But suppose he feels that that is a standard at which he is inept also, to which he is inadequate also. Why now then, dropping lower, dropping lower still in self-valuation, he needs now to form a secondary line of defense values, as it were, to protect him against his failure to be a successful conformist. And so you get other varieties of social metaphysics, of which one of the most socially significant is a man such as Ellsworth Toohey, the man who goes after power. Now, Ellsworth Toohey is not a conformist in the superficial sense that Keating is. Of course, he is a conformist in the deeper sense that he's not really challenging the fundamental moral values of his culture, but he's, he's cashing in on them, on their corruption. But he doesn't take the obvious path that Keating takes. Tui is a man with less authentic self-confidence than poor Peter Keating has. Tui is a man who, in effect, shares Peter Keating's fear of other people but he doesn't have Peter Keating's confidence that he, too, he could succeed, as it were, in the free market of social metaphysical competition. 
he doesn't feel that he could make it by the conventional route within his particular culture. And now I talk about the psychology of the power luster of a dictator in general, whether it be James Taggart or Adolf Hitler or Stalin or Khrushchev or people closer to home still. <laughs> we deal now with an interesting species of social metaphysician. That is, the social metaphysician who is afraid of people who desperately wants their approval and their sanction, and who hates people for the fact of his own fear of them, who feels a profound hostility, a profound hatred of people over the fact of his own humiliating fear of them, his own sense of inadequacy with regard to their standards. And now we get a new direction, a kind of man motivated by hatred, by hostility, by destructiveness, seeking to, at the one hand, to punish, to avenge himself against, and simultaneously to harness and control those others out there of whom he is so afraid, and who control that supernatural unknowable, namely reality. And so you get a Tui, a Taggart, a Hitler, a Stalin, or a Khrushchev. There is a marvelous line describing the psychology of a dictator in Galt's speech. Galt states, they, other people, are his only means of perception. And like a blind man who depends on the sight of a dog, he feels he must leash them in order to live. And that's a marvelous characterization of the psychology of the dictator or the power seeker. This is the person who feels helpless in reality, feels helpless in the position of seeking, in effect, voluntary help or approval from others, and who, in order to feel secure, needs to control those other consciousnesses which he dreads. because. If he can force them to obey him, if they can be coerced to act as though his ideas were true, why that, for all practical purposes, will make them true, since there's no such thing as an objective reality anyway. As an example of what I mean, ask yourself, what is going on in the mind of the dictator who stands up on the balcony beaming down at a spontaneous demonstration in his honor, which he knows perfectly well his own underlings arranged. And yet, his enjoyment of the occasion is un undeniable. And you wonder, well, what's the nature of his pleasure when he knows how it all came about? That is only an evidence of the distance from reality of this type of social metaphysician, of how unreal is the universe in which he lives. That if they can be compelled to fake a reality for him, that's as close to reality as he will ever get. One other quotation from Galt's speech, quote, just as the mystic is a parasite in matter who expropriates the wealth created by others, just as he is a parasite in spirit who plunders the ideas created by others, so he falls below the level of a lunatic who creates his own distortion of reality to the level of a parasite of lunacy who seeks a distortion created by others." Close quote. And in that sense, the power luster is marvelously described as a parasite of lunacy who seeks a distortion created by others, who is willing to have those others coerced who is cheerfully willing to have articles praising him, eulogies praising him, songs and hymns written to him, prepared at gunpoint, and still he smiles and basks in it, and this gives him his sense of efficacy. He is able to control those other consciousnesses and thus to gain some sense of security, some diminution of his chronic dread. And if you understand this profound alienation from reality, which characterizes this type, you can realize how comparatively healthy and wholesome is a man such as Peter Keating, <laughs> by comparison. 
What he wants is so simple and wholesome. Now, there is still another variety of social metaphysician. He doesn't work at it. He doesn't try to earn it honestly or semi-honestly by Peter Keating. He doesn't strive to earn it by charm or faking charm or faking ability. He doesn't go after power. This type very often does very little at all, in fact. And this is his claim to virtue, that he is too good for this world. And now we come to another variety. Again, rationalizing his failure to succeed on the terms prescribed by others, feeling that the world is controlled by others, but feeling inadequate to that world, he announces, in effect, that life on earth is too harsh, too crude, too materialistic. His acquaintances must love and respect him, not for what he does, doing is so vulgar, <laughs> but for what he is. What is he? That is something not to be defined or communicated. If you love me, you will know. <laughs> he is a composite of dream, aspiration, and ineffable longing. He rationalizes his failure to win social approval and esteem by the declaration that no one is fine enough to appreciate the real him. Whatever he does in reality, that's not the real him. Such a type may often prefer to be alone, and so in order that he may better dream of how he would be loved and admired if only people could know what he was really like deep, deep down inside. So this man isn't necessarily an organization man. He doesn't go to parties. He doesn't tell jokes. He doesn't try to be entertaining. He doesn't try to sleep with girls. He doesn't want to make himself out to be a big shot. He's content very often just to sit alone and to fantasy that he's got a million dollars and that every woman faints when she sees him or some other variety of daydream in which he resides and he perhaps has very few social relationships whatsoever and no concern with the world of facts whatsoever. His is a different kind of alienation from the real world, but it's an alienation nonetheless. The ultimate expression of this type of cutting loose can be observed in the religionist who can cut loose from the human race altogether and who gets his <laughs> sense of social metaphysical virtue from imagining that God is looking down on him, is perceiving the true nobility of his soul, which men here are too blind and too corrupt to care about. And God is smiling and lovingly offering him protection, even though everyone here on earth is too mean to. In effect, it's God who he's trying to impress, as it were, or he's imagining that this is where he's popular. He's not popular at the country club. He couldn't make it. He couldn't get in. He's popular with God instead. <laughs> this is what I mean by developing a secondary line of defense values, a secondary line of secondary type of pseudo self-esteem when the first primary social metaphysical form of pseudo self-esteem collapses. Still another variety of social metaphysician is the individual whose self-expression consists of shopping among the various subcultures available in order to decide which bandwagon to climb on rather than accepting the first one offered. This is, for example, the adolescent who proudly, scornfully, and self-consciously rejects the value system of his respectable and conventional parents and makes himself a slave to the value system of Greenwich Village instead. Here is still another variety where this type is more in the category of a conformist, only he is simply shopping with regard to what particular value system within the given culture he will conform to. For example, the son who defiantly leaves home to join the anarchist movement because his father has suggested to him that perhaps it is time to start earning a living now that he, the son, is approaching 40. <laughs> Such an individual has no concept of independence, whatever. He doesn't originate any of his own goals in any meaningful sense of that term. But he imagines himself to be self-reliant because he rejects one group in favor of conformity to another and watches out of the corner of his eye to make sure that all the other groups have noticed and are suitably impressed by the fact that he is not conforming to them. Then there is the, what I call the independent social metaphysician. 
This is a type psychologically akin to the psychology of the dictator, but perhaps less ambitious. This is the professional rebel, the professional antagonist, the man who is against everything and for nothing. This is the man who has no positive values of his own, but who is simply against. This is the type that, for example, will insult you on sight, lest you dare to imagine that he desires your approval. He desires nobody approval, he'll hasten to tell you. He doesn't want people to love him. He much prefers, indeed, that they hate him. He scorns money, marriage, jobs, baths, and haircuts, typically. <laughs> this type is so uncertain of winning anyone's approval, so profoundly insecure, that he cannot bear to suffer the anxiety of waiting to see how people will react to him. He's got to insult and abuse them first. This will prove to himself that he doesn't give a damn, and it's this that he wishes everyone clearly to understand, that he doesn't care at all what they think of him. And here again, we deal with a type of person who has no concept of objective reality, who in effect moves in a world where there's other people's whims and his whims. And his concept of independence is expressed through the notion that he'll assert his whims rather than other people's whims. Whatever other people say, he'll say the opposite. I remember once uh, giving a lecture at, uh, I believe it was CCNY several years ago. I was giving a lecture on uh, objectivism, and during the question period, a young man in the back row put up his hand and he asked me the following question. He wanted to know what was the objectivist position on wearing ties. <laughs> and uh, he evidently believed that I couldn't be very much of an individualist since I appeared at the university lecture wearing a suit and a tie. And he wanted to know whether or not this represented some sort of concession <laughs> of conformism. Well, you see, if a person is backed into a position where his only concept of self-assertiveness or of independence is to be found in not wearing a tie, he's in rather bad shape. <laughs> Which may be sad, but what I asked him is why did he want to announce it publicly? <laughs> Rebelliousness alone is not a proof of independence. By itself and out of context, it is a proof of nothing. The person who is merely against without being for is motivated only by hatred and by terror. He is merely a reactor to others and is as much their slave as the most abject of conformists. Only the pursuit of positive values can constitute evidence of independence. Motivation by fear and hate is not intellectual sovereignty. Remember that the fact that a man is not in step with society doesn't yet tell you anything worth knowing until you know why. After all, John Galt and Coffee Miggs are both, in a manner of speaking, outside of society. Neither of them is an organization man. But they're outside of society in somewhat different directions. You can be outside of society because you are better or because you are worse, because you are higher, or because you are lower, because you have superior values, or because you cannot even live up to the conventional values. Now, these merely represent some of the commonest, easiest to find varieties of social metaphysics, and I want to emphasize that this is not meant as an ironclad classification. In other words, you can find an individual who will have attributes from several of these types. These are abstractions which represent the essence of various social metaphysical attitudes, but the given person can combine traits, as I say, from several of these different classifications. I want to talk finally about what I call the good social metaphysician. Well, what is the good social metaphysician? This is the person who, first of all, has preserved some significant extent of intellectual independence, although 
a limited independence because he is still a social metaphysician. He is not on the premise of exclusive reliance upon his own mind, certainly not in issues of basic values, but who is not merely a passive parasitical follower. In other words, a person who may be hardworking, who may be productive, who may be conscientious, who may achieve and produce things of genuine merit or importance, and who may struggle very unhappily against his own social metaphysical fear and dependence, which he doesn't understand. In other words, he can be aware of his humiliating fear of others, his humiliating concern with their approval. He may struggle desperately and conscientiously against it, he may give in to it very little. He may try to earn any appreciation or admiration which anybody gives him. He may be very much opposed to and uh, inimical to the idea of getting an unearned or unwarranted admiration or appreciation from others, who does try to win their esteem at least by producing something of real value or being a person of real value, at least in some respects. Nonetheless, such a person is committed to a policy of dependence within the sphere of basic values. He is not questioning the fundamental values that guide his life. He is on the premise, implicitly of course, that these are to be provided and prescribed by others. And not identifying this policy, he is not in a position to change his social metaphysical psychology, since it can only be changed by independent thinking fundamentally on the issue of values, and who can struggle very miserably for many years against his humiliating state. And this, as I say, represents the better type of, shall I say, semi-honest or semi-decent person who would not be going after the unearned in any of the obvious ways in the foregoing examples, evidence, or exemplified in the foregoing examples of, let us say, Keating or Tui or the other types that we discussed. Now, when we turn to the state of modern psychology, we observe a very remarkable thing, and that is that the great majority of psychological theorists regard the state which I describe as social metaphysics in effect as man's normal condition. They don't of course have the term social metaphysics which I originated, but I mean that state of relationship to reality in other men is in their view not a disease but a description of human nature. They would say in effect, well of course self-esteem depends on whether one is loved or not loved by others. On what else could it possibly depend? Of course our sense of personal worth is a function of our human relationships. What else could it be a function of? And this view with minor unimportant differences can be found in Freud, it can be found in Karen Horney, it can be found in Harry Stack Sullivan, it can be found in Eric Fromm, it can be found in the great majority of the psychologists who have expressed a viewpoint on this subject one way or the other. Let me remind you, for example, of Freud's concept of the id, the ego, and the superego, which is so central to the theory of psychoanalysis. The id, according to Freud, represents your inherited instinctual impulses or drives, your amoral, illogical wishes. Then your is your ego, which roughly approximates the concept of an organ whose function it is to perceive reality, and your superego, the repository of your moral judgments or your moral values, which are what? Well, moral injunctions absorbed from parents or teachers or their surrogates. You absorb all notions of morality or right or wrong from the authorities in your childhood, specifically the parents. And then Freud more or less sees uh, Man's psychological life is a battlefield between the superego, the ego, and the id, or a battlefield that might be described between the I wish, the id, the it is, the ego, and the they say, 
the superego. <laughs> and of course, very significantly, the weakest contestant in this battle is, guess who? Of course, <laughs> as you all know, it's man's ego, that poor, frail, little reasoning organ which is there to remind man as best it can, now and again, when it can, that after all, there is reality out there, and one should attempt some sort of rapprochement or meeting ground or deal between your ego and your superego, its conflicting claims, and let us throw a bone to objective reality too, when and as we can, which, as Freud tells us, is not too often. Perhaps the most extreme presentation of social metaphysics as a theory of human nature is in the very influential writings of the psychiatrist Harry Stack Sullivan. Claims that man is motivated primarily by only two motives. One, the desire for the satisfaction of his bodily or physical needs, and two, the desire for what he calls security, which consists of avoiding the disapproval of anyone to whom one attaches importance. These are the two basic motives, satisfaction of your bodily needs and avoiding the disapproval of anyone to whom you attach importance, the significant others, to use the famous phrase. Now, why must man avoid the disapproval of those significant others? You might be naive enough or rational enough to ask Sullivan. And the answer is ultimately because it is they who will take care of him and provide him with the satisfaction of those physical needs. Sullivan speaks of the self as a, quote, organization of successful tricks, mostly linguistic, by which we conciliate others and get as much satisfaction as we can. If one would read modern psychological textbooks, one would have the overwhelming impression that love and not reason is man's basic tool of survival. And of course, the, aside from the fact that this theory is wrong, it's disastrous practically when you consider that the great majority of the people who seek the help of a psychotherapist are social metaphysicians. Not all, but the great majority. And to be advised and, gu and guided by a person who, in effect, shares their ultimate frame of reference imposes rather strict limitations on the extent of the help he can offer one can safely say. Now, we must ungraciously ask ourselves, if only for a moment, why would modern psychology, why would modern psychology view man in this manner? And the answer we may wish to say must lie at least in part in the fact that since the majority of men are social metaphysicians to a greater or lesser extent, that is the kind of person who the psychologist and the psychotherapist meets presumably more than any other. Is this a satisfactory answer? Well, it can't be, because it leads us to a rather obvious next question. When the psychologist or the psychiatrist is observing this phenomenon, he's got to pass judgment, healthy or unhealthy. Is this uh, the way human nature is actually constituted, or is this a disease? Well. What obvious factor will be very relevant in how he answers that question? Clearly, whether or not he regards the patient's basic social metaphysical frame of reference as something very strange to him indeed, something flagrantly out of step with reality, or whether it's a condition with which he feels very much at home whether in effect he feels, yes, that is the way things are. And if he can see the kind of phenomena which I have been discussing here and regard this as within the sphere of the normal, it's difficult to think how this could come about if not because it felt normal to him. Because a man of sovereign consciousness would have great difficulty in even understanding the social metaphysicist's frame of reference. It would be quite a feat of abstraction even to arrive at an understanding of that perspective on reality. If the psychotherapist's heart just goes out to it the first time he encounters it and never bothers him to ask, is this really the way things are or is this perhaps part of the illness? I leave it to you what the explanation there can be, if not that he's too familiar by introspection with the disease which he's being hired to cure. If we look back over this evening's lecture and over last week's lecture, we can observe variations on a very important theme. 
There is a very important statement in Galt's speech about which one could write a book or indeed several books. And Galt's speech, for that matter, is filled with very, very profound and significant statements whose meaning is indicated only in a very general way, but where there's a tremendous amount of very worthwhile work for other people to do on considering the implications of many of the observations and the principles observed or laid down here. And one of the most important psychologically is Galt's statement to the effect that all the root of all the human evils and ills which people exhibit is men's desire to escape from the responsibility of a volitional consciousness. This is one of the most truly pregnant and significant observations in the speech, certainly within the sphere of psychology. The extent to which the root of all evil, psychologically, so to speak, and morally, is the desire to escape from the responsibility of a volitional consciousness. And we can see in how many ways this operates in our discussion last week and again tonight. It's always the quest, always the attempt to escape the responsibility of thought, to escape the responsibility of judgment, to escape the fact that one is not infallible, that one has to initiate the effort of, of thought and then check one's conclusions and check again and then commit oneself to one's actions and suffer the consequences if one is wrong. It's always the escape, the effort to escape all of this to try to exist as something other than a human being, to try to exist as something other than man. And perhaps the worst horror which the social metaphysician endures is the secret feeling that perhaps he has succeeded in making himself something other than man.